Uh, so thanks for the invitation. It's a very interesting uh, workshop. Uh, I learned already a bunch of things by uh, attending the talks of the other participants. Today I'm going to talk to you about the uh, uh, result that we have in the in my lab. This is joint work with uh, Scott, uh, Juan, and uh, my postdoc, uh, Mohammed uh, Afsari. And this uh, has to do with a problem on um, uh, team games. And I explain uh, uh, what uh, the problem is. Uh, so most of the work that uh, you're familiar with, and most of the work that I'm familiar with, uh, has to do with uh, a single agent, typically possibly two agent problems, right? Where you're looking for equilibria, and again, uh, in these types of problems, uh, you have to have uh, have to put your shoes in the opponent's uh, uh, shoes and try to figure out uh, how you uh, interact with an opponent. And most of the work out there is uh, in a zero sum game, perhaps even a non zero sum game, but typically is uh, uh, for uh, two agents. And I will uh, focus here on the uh, 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 zero sum game, and I'm assuming simultaneous moves. And there are a lot of results when you have two players play against each other. Uh, however, this is not reality. In reality, you have multiple agents uh, and perhaps uh, in participating in multiple teams, right? You can think about uh, military confrontations or uh, most likely athletic uh, events when you have two teams uh, competing against one another. So so what can you say about uh, uh, teams? Uh, so, uh, so in general, this is a difficult problem. Um, so we like to generalize, or let's try to see what we can say about generalizing zero-sum game for two competing teams, and uh, to make the following assumptions to make the problem uh, tra tractable. So I assume that each team will receive the same reward, but uh, the problem that I have uh, both teams uh, and players within a team uh, make the problem a little bit more complicated because there are two levels here. You have the team members that uh, within the same team that they uh, collaborate. And then the two teams at so the team level, they, they compete against each other. Um, also, uh, the problem may uh, have different um, uh, information structures uh, because for each agent, uh, you may have some common information that everyone in the team knows, and maybe have some private information that only some of the uh, agents know. Okay. Now, one may assume um, that uh, we can do a very, uh, very uh, generalized approach, right? We can have a super agent uh, that did, you know, you, you have all, all the agents in one big vector. Uh, but the problem, of course, is uh, two, two problems. One is that the complexity, of course, increases exponentially. But if you do that, then you put everybody in the same boat. Uh, and therefore, you lose this information structure. Then basically, that means that uh, every agent is a member of the team and everybody knows everything else, which is not necessarily true. I want to capture, again, uh, the, this uh, non-classical information structure uh, when you have um, both common and private information. So how do you solve this problem? Um, so I make the following assumptions. Uh, the problem, again, is uh, extremely difficult. I'm not claiming that I have a solution, but I'll give you a result that I think simplifies a little bit how to think about these types of problems. So I will assume that I have uh, both teams have homogeneous uh, agents, so all of them are the same, uh, same and indistinguishable. Um, now, this actually can be extended uh, to uh, uh, teams within with uh, certain sub-teams. So within the team, there may be a bunch of sub-teams which are uh, homogeneous. Uh, if you want to, I'm not going to spend time on that. It's very similar, the approach, just the notation becomes a little bit more complex. But uh, my student, uh, Scott, is going to give a talk later today, and he will go a little bit more great in detail in the, in the sub-team case. Uh, well, assume I have a finite horizon problem, finite uh, action and state uh, spaces, it's easier to handle. And the main assumption I'm going to make here is that the agents uh, have uh, this weak coupling. Okay, So each agent uh, depends, or, the, or how the agent evolves, depends only on uh, its own uh, dyna uh, its own state, but also some uh, average behavior of the rest of the team. This is what is called uh, a mean field approximation, and I explain uh, a little bit uh, the notation here because uh, to be able to follow the, the developments. Um, the main uh, another assumption here is that the, there is what's called the mean field sharing. Uh, so that means that 
the agents can share uh, the average behavior of the whole team, okay? So here is the dynamic a little bit uh, to explain and the notation. If there is a superscript, it means I'm talking about the finite population because then I'm gonna look at the limit. Uh, so the superscript N1, this is the blue team. So I have a blue team and I have the red team. X uh, is the blue team, Y is the red team. Uh, the blue team has N1 agents, the red team has N2 agents. And here basically says that the dynamics, so let's say uh, on agent I, uh, the probability is going to end up in this state, given some action, uh, depends on the action is going to take, and uh, also um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the joint state of uh, the, other, uh, the other members of the team, but in a particular manner, and the particular manner is this, okay? So uh, the transition probability depends on where you are, the action you take, and the average behavior, or the average effect, uh, you will see what this is, this is empirical distribution of the... Uh, of the of the of the of the team, uh, the own team, the blue team, and the red team. New is again for the uh, blue team. New is the empirical distribution for the red team. Um, again, I will assume here that the blue team is maximizing and the red team minimizes. And the reward is is this. Uh, it depends only on the what the average the average behavior of the blue team and the red team uh, achieves. Okay, so here's the information structure. Um, so, so each uh, agent, um, let's say from, uh, so I'm going to use phi to denote the uh, policy uh, for the blue team. So each agent at time t, uh, let's say for the finite uh, population gain, uh, it's going to be some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, policy that it depends on the state of the individual agent and the average, of, the average effect of uh, of both uh, its own team and the opponent team. And similarly for the red agent. So actually, so this is happens for every instant of time. So I can uh, collect all of the all the times. And so this is the agent, each agent strategy. And then I can collect all the agents and I have the each team strategy. Okay, the, the regular way. Uh, now, uh, I will also consider the case when all the strategies or all the agents are identical. That is in the case where for both for agents p and q uh, even they're different uh, the strategies are the same so uh, an identical team policy will be denoted by phi okay so one of the main things i want to investigate is uh, does it make sense to play identical policies or you can use different policies for each agent and what is the whether you can quantify any loss in performance if you do that um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, the information structure. So each agent in the policy depends on the common information. So the, uh, the, the empirical distributions are known for both agents, but then each agent has its local information, knows only its local state. So there is a local information and there is a private, sorry, the local information, and there is also common information or private information, similarly for local and uh, global information. All right. Uh, so how I'm going to solve this problem? Okay, so I'm going to set it up. Um, so this is this is what I want to standard. Up, uh, I guess if you just basically have a um, reward, the sum, summation of the rewards, um, and, and this is a cumulative reward. Um, and one, one team wants to maximize this, the other team wants to minimize. Uh, and here is the uh, the distributions, the vertical distribution, which basically tell you how many agents are in a particular state. Okay, uh, so I'm going to solve uh, a min max problem. Uh, it turns out for this problem, the value may not exist. So I'm gonna look uh, first from the blue agent's perspective. So I'm going to find, I'm gonna solve the, uh, I'm gonna solve a max min problem. I'm gonna look at the lower value uh, for the blue team. That means it's a guaranteed uh, behavior for the blue team. And then I'm gonna do the same for the red team. I'm gonna look at the upper value. So we can, in the paper, we have a counter example that shows that for this problem, you cannot expect to have a value. The min max is not the same as max min. So therefore I'm gonna look at uh, the lower value. Now, if you find a blue strategy is optimal, if actually uh, uh, it's the, the arc min that solves this problem. Okay, now, uh, if this is not possible, uh, you may be interested in uh, suboptimality, and this is actually a suboptimality bound. For example, if you find some other strategy and you want to figure out is going to be epsilon or suboptimal, if you uh, deviate, you, you guarantee that you'll not be more than epsilon away from what you could have achieved. Okay, so this, that's, that's a, again a standard, and you can do the same thing for the, for the red team. Okay, or here just describes uh, what I just said, empirical distribution. So, for example, suppose you have two states and you have in this case, uh, five agents. If three of them are in state one and two of them are in state two, uh, then the empirical distribution 
is 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. This is how you can think about this. All right, so here's how I'm going to solve this problem. Uh, I recognize that I'm, most, I'm not smart enough to solve the problem in, uh, uh, exactly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the same uh, the trick that I'm going to take to the infinite population problem. So I'm going to take uh, the number of agents, go to infinity, but by keeping the ratio the same. Okay, so both the both teams uh, increase the number of agents, but the ratio of the agents for the blue and the red team remain the same. So I'm going to get uh, an infinite population game. So I'm going to have a mean field approximation. So when I get a mean field approximation, I'm going to introduce two fictitious coordinators using a note a known trick uh, in the theory by uh, Nayar and Tony Kedjis back in the uh, seminal paper in 2000. 13, I believe. Um, and then I'm going to introduce a zero sum coordinator game, which I will be able to solve. Uh, but that would be for the infinite population game. And then the next thing I want to decide is, is it possible to get some of some guarantees about what this uh, result for the infinite population game tells me about the finite population game? And I just give you here uh, the, the gist of the, the, the answer uh, is that it's going to be an epsilon suboptimal strategy and it's going to scale one over square root of n where n is the number of agents. So basically, I'm going to show that if you do this approximation and you look at the infinite population game, uh, then uh, you're going to be with an epsilon for the finite population uh, under under certain assumptions, which I'll explain. Okay, so let's see how uh, what uh, how this is done. And so I need to uh, also show you a result, uh, an example. Um, so again, so we assume that both uh, teams have an infinite population game uh, for po infinite population, and when uh, uh, for this uh, infinite population, I will assume a di a di an identical team strategy. Okay, so. For the infinite population problem, since everybody is homogeneous, uh, I will assume that each agent uh, uses the same strategy. Okay, uh, it turns out that uh, in this case you can write down the dynamics. The problem becomes deterministic. This is kind of uh, well known, uh, and you get uh, basically uh, if I give you uh, the strategies again, there is no n here. These are identical strategies for the blue team and identical strategies for the red team. You can compute how the empirical distributions are going to propagate they're going to propagate like this okay you can you can write down this this is the transition metrics for the typical agent very similar to what people do in mean field games okay so in the common information so how i'm going to use this common information um so i'm going to use this uh, result with a fictitious coordinator so if i have a uh, private information, local information, and a global information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this fictitious coordinator, each for each team. And the role of a fictitious coordinator is to give, to choose an uh, identical strategy that will give to uh, the uh, to the to the agent. So basically, uh, what happened? The fictitious coordinator finds a policy, or the policy of the of the coordinator, which only uh, deals with the uh, uh, with empirical distributions, its job is to find a policy, okay, P, which will give to all agents, and each agent then is going to choose its action based on this policy and based where it is. Okay, so essentially you do a decomposition of the uh, general policy in something that is chosen by the coordinator and then the policy, and then uh, each agent then chooses its action based on this policy and the same policy. So this is how we're going to solve the problem. Um, so in this uh, problem, of course, it's simplified now because I have a two a zeros, I have a zero sum two player game played by the coordinators. Uh, the different state spaces now, right? So now the joint space is the uh, distributions, the empirical distributions. Um, then there is the join actions, the choice of the uh, the policies that I'm going to send to my team members. And uh, the reward is the same as before, and have already computed the dynamics. So to make a long story, you can solve this problem, okay? And um, and you find you find the solution, okay? And um, there is one more thing here, okay? So uh, maybe very quickly, uh, you can solve this problem using dynamic programming. Uh, but it turns out that uh, we have a better way of solving this problem uh, using reachability sets. Uh, essentially, the idea here is that each time you choose a particular policy to propagate the, the vertical distribution is equivalent to figuring out what is going to be the next uh, uh, the next uh, distribution, the, the, where the next distribution is going to be. So essentially, you can look. Uh, uh, you can look and search over the possible uh, vertical distribution of the next time step. 
And after you do that, there is a way to figure out what is the policy that will give you this empirical distribution. Um, so here is the, uh, the first result. Um, so it basically says that if I give you some joint spaces and the corresponding empirical distribution and I find a population game and given any blue team policy, phi, which is potentially not identical, there exists a mean field such that this is true. What this tells you is that uh, even uh, if you have a finite population, uh, the, the empirical distribution between a finite population game and an infinite population game can be made, uh, can be made small. Essentially, if you have uh, some, if you start from here and you uh, choose any policy you like, you may end up uh, in this case, but there exists uh, an approximation using an, uh, uh, a policy which is identical for all agents uh, that is going to be an epsilon, uh, epsilon close to this. Okay, so that's uh, the result. So essentially, uh, what I'm saying is that suffices for the blue team to approximate all possible uh, empirical distribution uh, using the mean field uh, within a reachable set. And remember, this mean field is calculated using uh, identical policies. Um, so here's the performance guarantees. Um, it says the following. It says the optimal uh, blue team coordinated strategy is obtained, which we obtain using the infinite population coordinator game. It uses an epsilon optimal strategy in the finite population game. So if this is the optimal, and if I use uh, uh, identical uh, policy, I can let my opponent to use any policy that likes, even non-identical, okay? Then I'm guaranteed uh, that uh, the error in the performance is gonna be no more than this, which is, uh, uh, becomes less and less as the number of edges uh, increase. Essentially, what it says in plain English, that even if we assume that the opponent employs a non-identical strategy to exploit us and guess our own identical strategy, the resulting error is within a bound from the best we could have achieved. Okay, and the error diminishes as the number of agents, uh, the team's populations increase. So this is kind of important uh, because most of the mean field uh, work out there is done for a, for a single team. Uh, there is a work, of course, that's been done on games, but not many, uh, many, not many work on mean field games. And the reason is, for example, for us here, we can make an assumption that we use an identical strategy, for example, but we don't know what the opponent is going to do. I mean, you can make this assumption, but the opponent may not use an identical strategy. So you have to quantify what is the effect, for example, right? right? So we can decide, okay, guys, we're going to use an identical strategy, given this is what we're going to do, but you have to assume something of the opponent. Right? And it's not clear that if you assume an identical strategy of the opponent, things will work out or there's going to be some uh, within some finite bound. So let me have only a few minutes. So let me go through an example uh, to show you. It's a very simple example. It's only two states and uh, a few agents. Um, but I think it demonstrates uh, pictorially what is going on. Okay, so we assume that we have uh, two states, X1 and X2. There's a bunch of agents in X1 and a bunch of agents in X2 for the, this is the blue team. And then we have the red team. Again, kind of only two states, Y1 and Y2. Some agents are in Y1 and some agents are Y2. And for both cases, uh, in both cases, the, uh, there are two actions, U1 and U2, and this is the transitions. Okay, so uh, I will set up the problem uh, such that the terminal reward, um, sorry, the reward at zero and one is nothing, is zero. And uh, the terminal reward, I have only two time steps, is uh, the empirical distribution of Y1. So the reward is that uh, the number of agents uh, that are uh, in Y1. So the, uh, the red agents wants to uh, maximize the number of agents that will end up in Y1 after two time steps. And the blue agent tries to minimize that, okay? So uh, I can set up the problem such that uh, again, very simple. These are the transition probabilities, but basically what it says is that uh, the red agents that do nothing at time T0, at T1, uh, the red agent is such that so the transition probabilities are such that Y1 is absorbing, so you cannot do much. So the only action that actually is out there is uh, the agents at Y2 to choose at some point to use uh, action V2 to move to Y1, okay? That's the only thing they can do. However, where they will achieve this transition from Y2, of course, they want to play V2 to end up to Y1 to maximize the number of agents to Y1. It turns out the transition probabilities is affected by the mean field of the blue team. Essentially, the blue, depending on how many agents are 
in the X1 and X2, that will determine how successful the agents uh, move from Y2 to Y1. Does it make sense? So therefore, and you can see here, uh, there is the transition probabilities, and it turns out that the success depends on how far of the blue team is from this. So if the blue team manages to get this, uh, uh, this distribution, then it completely blocks any movement from agents from Y2 to Y1. Okay, so we know actually by looking at this, what the optimal strategy is, I mean, what each agent is going to do. Um, by the way, uh, action, uh, the blue agents is like this. So they actually, I set up the problem uh, such that uh, the blue team has deterministic transitions, so actually can move any, uh, any, if decides to move a particular agent from X1 to X2 or X1, they can do it. So everything is uh, basically deterministic. So, all right, so let's see what you can do with this uh, formulation. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the red uh, strategy uh, in both finite and uh, infinite population uh, uh, versions of the problem is to always apply Y2, try to go to send as many agents from Y2 to Y1. That's obvious because you want to maximize the number of agents in Y1. The blue strategy in the infinite population game is also obvious. He wants to match this distribution, okay? Because if you match the distribution, it will block all the agents from moving from Y2 to Y1. However, this is feasible in the infinite population game, but it's not feasible in the finite population game because it's a square root is irrational. You cannot get uh, one over square root two with a uh, rational number, uh, natural number of agents. So in the infinite population game, you can do that, but the finite population game is not possible. Um, so the coordinator game, again, you can see we solve the problem. This is simple enough. We can discretize and we solve the problem. Uh, interestingly, as you expect at the time T1, uh, this is the best for the blue team, is the maximum, right? Uh, is exactly at square root of, so you have to put all the uh, X agents, uh, the blue team in X1, uh, and you exactly get the distribution as expected. So pictorially, uh, this is what happens. Okay, good. Um, so this is an example also that demonstrates uh, that there is an incentive uh, to deviate uh, from the identical strategy, at least for the finite population. Okay, so there is incentive for the blue team to deviate from identical team strategy. It's easy to see why this is the case. Uh, so let's suppose that you have uh, three agents, the blue team has three agents, and all of them start uh, at uh, X1. So uh, remember, the, uh, uh, the, uh, if you apply the identical mixed uh, policy, such that uh, the agent, uh, for example, uses has a little bit move here, U1 with probability one over square root and U2 with probability one, uh, one minus uh, square root of root is an expectation will match the target distribution, okay? But in reality, you have only three agents. So it, whether you're gonna end up depends on the, the probability. So for example, this is how we compute the probabilities that uh, 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 if you, uh, well, that you have all three agents remain at one, uh, and none of them zero is this probability. Is the probability that two thirds uh, at one and one third, one out of three in X2 is this, et cetera, et cetera. So you can compute what is in expectation, what's going to happen. And in the expectation, uh, basically, uh, this is so if you use the identical team strategy, basically, uh, this is how many agents may transit from Y2 to Y1. But you can choose a non identical, and this is deterministic strategy. And it's very easy to figure out that you can uh, do it in a certain way that blue agents one and two apply action U1. Okay, uh, blue agents three applies action two. So basically you achieve that the next uh, empirical distribution is this deterministically. You can achieve that. And this uh, allows only, which is the closest to uh, this, uh, the good one, that's one, right? Um, and uh, in this case, uh, um, only uh, very few go through. Um, okay. So of course, again, uh, there is a uh, using non non identical policy. It could be better, but again, uh, as we show, as the number of uh, agents go to infinity, this error becomes small. And and here we show the difference as expected. This is the bound and occur the difference between the optimal uh, versus uh, the identical team strategy. And as you uh, increase uh, the number of agents, this is decreasing uh, as expected. All right, so. Take away, um, uh, basically, uh, for uh, zero-sum infield team games with local with uh, weak interaction, uh, we showed that restriction to identical team strategies for both teams uh, only leads to a small performance loss. And this loss uh, decreases as the number of agents approach infinity. So this is useful. 
Um, I think we can use this for a multiple age, uh, sorry, uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning problem. We have like a thousands of agents. So you don't have to, uh, intuitively speaking, you don't have to develop 1,000 different policies for a thousand agents. You can have one policy for the whole team. Uh, if they if you have a lot of a lot of agents, uh, that means that yeah, you're going to be not optimal, but this uh, this bound is going to be smaller and smaller as the number of agents becomes increases. Uh, future work, uh, a lot of things. Um, so sub teams, uh, I think we have done it already. Um, I think you look at uh, the talk uh, later today. Um, one thing is uh, how do you estimate the belief of the opponent or the the, the empirical distribution of the opponent? You need to know that to uh, to implement the policy. All right, um, and then uh, perhaps uh, maybe again, maybe we can uh, uh, for more complicated problems, maybe we need to use some uh, um, reinforcement learning techniques to solve more complicated problems. So if you're interested, uh, this is the paper. Um, it has all the details uh, and all the proofs, uh, but I hope you got the main the gist of the of this result. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have time for some questions. Yeah. Oh, that's the same question as the last speaker. But uh, what have the changes to the zero sum assumption? Well, um, the zero sum assumption, um, well, you're going to have a non zero sum game at the coordinators. So basically, you have to solve this. So. Uh, as you know, typically, if you can solve a non-zero sum game for two game players, the two player game, then you can use that result. This is a result primarily between uh, finite and infinite population. So you're going to have, you can play again the same trick where each coordinator knows only the common information and chooses the strategy and distributes to the player. So if you can solve this problem efficiently, you can apply it to a non-zero sum. There's a question from the chat. Would there be incentive for collusion between members of different teams. I guess it's kind to of do what? Collusion between members of different teams. I don't know. I, I don't I don't know. So I, I guess it's more it like is a, more of a that's in the team the teams uh, at the team level, right? So I'm not sure. I don't know. So so in some way are you reducing like the teams to be like competing teams to be competing coordinators. Yeah, exactly. Still two, kind of two agents, but yes, the idea is that because if agency is the same, it doesn't really matter that much uh, who is going to do the job, right? I want to do the job. Whoever you know is there at that particular location does it. Um, so it turns out, however, uh, that people have shown uh, that this uh, comes at a cost. Typically, it, you're better if each agent uses its own policy. But here we say that if there's have a large population, because of the way things work, uh, it turns out you the error is not that is not uh, that uh, that large. You, uh, it becomes smaller as the number of agents becomes it tends to infinity. Yeah, but typically, yeah, you can uh, as the, actually the last example shows that you can get better if you use different yeah. policies. Although they're homogeneous, but fantastic mm -hmm. talk. Really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks.